production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. This time on Broad and High. We're celebrating the women of the art world and those who dare to be heard. The difficulty in studying women in the arts is really that they aren't recorded, they aren't talked about. So this was a great opportunity to bring some questions to light, but also to celebrate women artists. This and more right now on Broad and High. Welcome to Broad and High, I'm your host, Kate Quickle, and we're here again inside the studios of 400 West Rich Street in Franklinton. So in 1989, the feminist group known as the Guerrilla Girls created one of their most well-known billboards in New York City. It stated, do women have to be naked to get into the Metropolitan Museum of Art? It was an indictment on the lack of women artists represented in the modern art section of the museum, but yet most of the nude paintings there were of the female form. So although women have always worked as artists, institutional bias and sexism often were barriers to getting the recognition and acknowledgement they so deserved. And as recently as three years ago, when the Cultural Arts Center hosted an exhibit celebrating 100 years of contemporary art, the contributions made by women were nowhere to be found. That is until someone left a post-it note asking where they were. And that's where our story begins. <laughs> In, in 2013, we were working on an exhibition of contemporary art in, in, in Columbus, Ohio. And it was actually the 100th anniversary of a very famous show in the United States called the 1913 Armory Show. And we were kind of curious to see how contemporary art had evolved over that 100 years. So as part of this exhibition, we, we worked with some art historians and we put together a, a really cool timeline that showed major cultural events in, in the country over the last hundred years. And we thought it would be neat to see the artwork that reflected all of those moments. And someone came to the exhibit and put up a post-it note that said, Women, M-I-A, question mark. And so what they realized is, is they had disincluded women from an entire 23-foot timeline. And we were just horrified by this. We all agreed, we, we, we can't just push this under the rug. We have to respond somehow. And so rather than sweeping that under the carpet and saying, whoops, they decided to make an entire exhibit to respond to that post-it note. So this exhibit, Dare to be Heard, is not just a visual arts exhibit. It's a multimedia exhibit. So we wanted to make sure that all, uh, all creatives were invited to the table. So it's dancers, writers, uh, performers, and visual artists. Emotionally, I feel a little bit of shame. But not enough to make me stop eating it. I've been working as a designer for my whole life and it's very behind the scenes, like you do things and it launches and it's, your name is not, your face is not connected to it. Being an artist is like pushing me out further. So it is a dare to be heard from, from a personal standpoint for me. Uh, for me, Occupy, my personal power means focus on love, uh, focus on compassion and empathy for everyone as challenging as it is, even the people that don't care that much about me, but uh, personal power for you might be a different thing. Personal power might just be, you know, just speaking up for some other people. So women have always been artists. They have always been working in the arts. It's a very human activity, right? So we can go back to I mean, really, 20,000 BCE, we can go more than 20,000 years back, um, and we see the production of these little stone female figurines, right, which scholars today think might have been made by women, you know, for themselves. They might have been self-portraits, they might have been 
um, images that speak to the, the importance of fertility. Um, so the, the difficulty in studying women in the arts is really that they aren't recorded, they aren't talked about um, and remembered the way male artists, famous male artists, right, that we can name. So this isn't just Columbus-based artists, this is actually an international show. Uh, we have an artist from Pakistan, we have an artist from uh, Montreal, but we wanted to make sure that the conversation was larger than uh, our Columbus community, because this is a larger worldwide topic that we should be discussing. This is something that I believe in and have believed in my whole, my whole career, um, that women in the arts are often not given the same platform as their male counterparts. So this was a great opportunity to bring some questions to light, but also to celebrate women artists. When we think about art, we think of painting and sculpture and architecture and all those endeavors that were the realm of, of men. And so the significance of what we call decorative arts or minor arts, uh, knitting, embroidery, um, and even something like drawing. It was by the Renaissance considered important for women to learn how to draw and how to paint. It was a, an appropriate activity for them, right? But it was never seen as the same as, as what men did. I think there's a lot of different statements in this exhibition and I think that's really important that when we're talking about an entire gender we need to make sure that we're talking about what that means in all of its identities whether we're talking about beauty standards or race or being a mother these are all individual stories that make up a larger whole. The National Museum of Women in the Arts in Washington, D.C. is the only major museum in the world dedicated to recognizing women's creative contributions. Check them out at nmwa.org, where you can see highlights from their collection, including work by Mary Beale, considered one of England's first professional female painters. The rest of our show today is filled with women artists doing amazing things, like illustrator Rachel Ignatowski, who, through her art, makes learning fun. There we go, that's good. There's Thor. See, I got to say pretty boy lips for smooching. <laughs> they let me write whatever I want. It's a really, I, I love working with clients who trust me because then I get a lot of really cool work done. Pretty boy lips for smooching. Bullets, a daytime to evening look arc reactor may cause heartburn. Just some of the wonderfully creative fodder Rachel Ignatowski conjures in her creative Casey Lair for one of her many high profile clients. This time it's for Fandango.com. For the Avengers series they kind of called me up and they were like we would like to do something with the Avengers. Um, we need it really quick. What do you want to do? So I said oh like why don't we just do an anatomy of them and they say okay thank you and then I say yay and then they feature me. And that's it. Which begs the question, how does one get on the Mighty Fandango's carte blanche contact list? Well, there are a few things you need to know about Rachel. First off, she's been at this a while. I knew I wanted to go into art when I was really young. So around 16 is when I got really serious about it. And I started going to pre-college classes and getting my portfolio together. And I always had an interest in science and biology. In fact, if I didn't go into art, I was going to maybe become a doctor or something like that. But um, I liked art much better. She's also passionate about gender equality, which made for a uniquely successful formula. That proved to be her golden ticket. How my Woman in Science series started was I have a lot of friends who are teachers. And we're sitting around and we're discussing um, you know, the gender gap that still exists. Science, mathematics, technology, engineering, those are all still very much boys' games. And so I started, you know, researching it a little more, and I thought, you know, I could, if I just draw these women in this sort of new whimsical way that no one's really doing right now, maybe that'll spark some people's interest in it. And also just to celebrate them so that people who have been inspired by these women can like have them up on their wall and be like, oh, thank you, Barbara McClintock. You really, really inspired me. Like, that's why I'm in genetics. The series includes popular favorites like Dr. Jane Goodall, 
the first woman in space, Valentina Tereshkova, to names and fascinating stories that have been buried in the history books, like the mother of the first complex computer code, COBOL, Grace Hopper, or pioneers of entire fields of science. Mary Anning, who was like pretty much the first paleontologist of her time, she found the first real full dinosaur skeleton. She wasn't allowed to be published because she was a woman. They weren't allowed to, and she was a poor woman at that. But she fought her way to get that information out there by being brave and becoming associated with noble gentlemen who then published that work for her and basically helped start that field. From paleontology to the first person to ever win a Nobel Prize in two different fields of science. Just Marie Curie, who's probably one of the best known ones, I mean, they didn't even want to give her her second Nobel Prize. And she also got very discredited because she was a woman and a foreigner to France. And you know what she did? She kept working. And then she drove a frickin' x-ray truck and like helped soldiers with broken bones. And it's, it's amazing. All the glass ceilings they had to break, all the rules they had to break to get to where they are and to accomplish what they accomplish. I think the best way to fight gender bias is through examples of strong females and to normalize women in positions of power. So when International Women's Day rolled around, Instagram took notice and featured her series. It has really taken off online. I have gone from having uh, like 1,500 followers to having over 40,000 followers. That has really motivated me to turn this into a book. A book featuring 50 of these amazing women will be published in fall of 2016. But from that event, something even better happened. I would come home from work and I, I felt like I was working another 40 hour week outside of work. And it started off as a little trickle where like the first thing that happened was people started buying stuff from my shop and then all of a sudden I'm making rent and then I'm making the same amount that I'm making at my day job. And then after that, everyone, all these different blogs and newspapers uh, started picking me up. And I didn't expect it to happen so quickly, but I, I always knew that something would happen if I worked hard. So she quit her job at Hallmark and set off on her own. Now she happily spends her days researching and drawing. I'm just so happy that I make a living doing this kind of work where I learn every day and it's like, I feel like I retired. It's nuts. Like, I feel like I'm like Coca Cabana, except <laughs> sitting in my room and researching and drawing. So far, she's worked with dozens of clients, from independent films to childhood cancer research organizations, breaking down complex science into understandable infographics, similar to what she does in her anatomy series, which includes what happens to the brain in love, the novel workings of the heart, cell structure, and many more. But there was one in particular that struck a special chord. A while ago, I got this little piece of fan mail from this father who bought my respiratory system print, and his daughter has CF. And so she's four years old, and she has to use a respirator at night. So he emailed me saying, thank you so much, because everything else that's out there kind of looks scary. And yours is all cuddly and happy, and she understands. It, it really calmed her, and he was happy that he could have that moment with his daughter. And it's one of those things where you're like, wow, illustration is a tool to help connect people with information that seems scary and dense and unapproachable. I think there's a way to start conversations by putting smiley faces on some cells. It's been amazing. It's been like, we'll see what happens next. <laughs> Rachel Ignatovsky's illustrated book that celebrates the achievements of women in science was published just this summer and instantly became a New York Times bestseller. Learn more at rachelignatovskydesign.com. Our next artist is based in Gahanna. Katura Ariel's work focuses largely on positive representations of young black women, something she didn't see much of as a young girl. And she has since turned a childhood passion into a very grown-up business. Here's more. I am originally from Toledo, Ohio. My family is from Detroit. Um, 
And then we all kind of migrated down here when I went to uh, Columbus College of Art and Design. I remember being younger and like not really seeing myself in places. Like when I was younger, I couldn't find paper dolls that look where that were brown, you know? <laughs> like I couldn't, so I made my own. And I did that as like a six-year-old little girl. I made my own paper dolls and it, it grew to like a collection of like a thousand paper dolls because that's how dedicated I was or passionate about seeing things that look like me in the world, you know. So with my work, I I want to show like people of color, black people doing regular things, you know what I mean, existing in their regular life and being happy or being sad or being playful or being in love, like that's all very important to me to just illustrate those those moments because you don't see them as much as you should, you know. But I always knew I wanted to make art. I just didn't know how I could turn that into something profitable. I think it was in 2012 is kind of when I figured out that I can actually sell my artwork on products. And that's when Ariel Brands came about. I basically took my artwork and started putting on everything that I could think of, like literally printing it on everything <laughs> I can think of. And so I just began to um, sell my work through uh, my web store and everything kind of like just turned around. <laughs> because I think that's one of the pieces that was missing from my childhood is seeing art like the stuff that I make. Um, I didn't see it, you know, so it's like being able to have access to it would be great, you know. I hope that all of my pieces are, they potentially can be a conversation piece, you know. Um, I hope so, like that's one of my, my goals. But I think like the whole social commentary of some of my pieces is really interesting because people who are used to seeing me like do playful stuff and it's always really more difficult for me to do stuff that has like pain in it, you know what I mean, or a struggle. But I think showing both is important. Showing both sides of the black experience is important. I have, you know, friends who are who are not black who love my stuff too and who wear it and proudly and like they still want to represent. Even though it's a, an experience that they don't feel directly, they still see the experience and appreciate it or, you know, share it for what it is, you know, and I think that's important too because we all need to have that conversation together. It doesn't need to be just one group of people. Back before, you know, when I was younger, when I was a kid, like that, we didn't, I didn't have access to seeing like a black artist, a black woman artist creating artwork and making money off of it and actually having her own studio and stuff like that. Like I didn't know they existed. <laughs> and so being able to fill that gap feels great for me because I know like the next generation, they'll have more examples that I didn't have when I was younger. You can find all of Keturah's products online at arielbrands.com. This next segment takes us to Miamisburg, Ohio, where we find Laura Van Leer. She spent nearly 20 years operating her couture bridal business on Broadway in New York City. But then this Cincinnati native decided to bring her sewing skills back home to Ohio. Fashion design wasn't my original goal. The sewing, I think, is what started it. It was creating something. I love to sew, and I love to draw, and then found out that that could be a career. I had a mom who was very supportive of my artistic scribblings as a kid, and she always encouraged me to follow that talent and she was instrumental in teaching me how to sew, although she said I surpassed her within a week. The entrepreneurial spirit came from my parents. They both had a business, and I grew up knowing that having your own business has its challenges, but I guess I just fell into that naturally. It wasn't so much fashion design as it was bridal design, and I found out that that's where my true love of design was because of the challenge of designing an all-white garment. My actual start in my career was moving to New York 
My first design job was as an assistant to a bridal designer. And I paid my dues there. And my second job was as the lead designer. I was 22 years old. I don't know what they were thinking, but they hired me. And my boss loved my last name, Van Leer. He thought it was very elegant. So he started using it in his advertising. I was there three years. And at that point, my sister had just graduated with her master's in business, and she also moved to New York. My business started because I had had enough with my boss one day, decided to quit. And I came home and announced to my sister, who had not yet found a job, I quit my job today. <laughs> and so we decided to start our own business. I would design 20 or 30 gowns per season, like for the spring season and for the fall season. And bridal retailers would come in and select from them. And eventually, my design was on the cover of Modern Bride magazine. We were interviewed by the bridal magazines every issue. So we stuck around. And we worked out of our showroom in New York, 7th Avenue, and went strong for a lot of years. The reason that I transitioned from New York to Ohio was the bridal industry was going through a difficult time. And I had to work longer hours in order to accomplish the same things at my end. I had two very small children. I hired a nanny to take care of my children so that I could work 14 hours a day and never see them. And one day I came home from work and my kids were being tucked into bed and I heard my daughter say, good night, mommy, to the nanny. And I said, that's it. That was the day that I said, I can't do this in New York anymore. The transition to Ohio was, this is where my roots are. And it was familiar and it made sense to me to come back and raise my children here. When I was back here in Ohio, I was working out of my home and I selected a handful of retailers that I wanted to continue to do business with. And I proposed that I design gowns specifically for their stores. Well, they loved it. Then my sister said, there's this really lovely bridal shop in Miamisburg, Ohio. You really ought to check it out. We offer many services, but mostly custom design. We also do alterations on gowns that have been purchased elsewhere. Fashion design is different, in my opinion, than custom design. The difference would be I'm not just creating a garment that I'm trying to sell. I'm creating a garment for this specific person. And it's not just to fit her event, but to fit her style and her personality and her body. Now I design individually for each customer. And so there's really no theme or trend I'm following. I'm sitting down and talking with a person. I find out what kind of an event it's gonna be and get an idea of their personality. And then I create something for them. I get a feel for her and her event and her vision. I'm thinking now of a bride. And then I take measurements. We look at fabric swatches and lace swatches. And then I make the pattern and make what's called a muslin. And the customer comes back for a fitting. Nothing fancy happening. It's just to test the pattern, make sure the garment is fitting well and is proportioned well. And while she's planning her other wedding details, I'm here sewing beads on and crystals on and finishing. And then there's the final day, the final fitting, where she is here to put on her garment. It's completely finished. It can take a week or it can take months. It just depends on the customer's schedule. From my perspective, it's wearable art in that there is so much that goes into a garment from sketching it and creating it to make this customer happy and adding all the details that makes it specifically for that customer. Running a business in Dayton has been a lot more enjoyable in many ways than running the business in New York. 
My plan for my shop is to continue making fabulous dresses for the women of Dayton for whatever event they have. I mean, I would like to, to grow. I would like to have more opportunities to design unique garments. I guess my plans for the future are to keep on doing what I do because I love what I do. I have a wonderful referral base, so for me, I love having a small business in Dayton. I enjoyed the New York years, but this is the business I want. That's our show. You can see all of today's stories at WOSU.org and, of course, on our Handy Handy mobile app. And be sure to check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're closing the show today with music by the Fan Todds, a Columbus band fronted by female rocker Gretchen King. Thanks for watching. We'll see you back here next week on Broad and High. Forgot our history, cause at one time we agreed, share the misery and hope. For Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at ColumbusMakesArt.com.